Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. We are continuing the Why We're Catholic book series. We are on to the last part in this book, part five, called Morality and Destiny. And so this book, in case you missed any of the other videos, it's kind of been building up. Like it starts off very basic, like why we believe in truth, why we believe in God, why we believe in Jesus. It kind of builds its way up. So we're on the final section. So I would recommend if you if this is your first video, I would start from the beginning before jumping into it. So it's good to just start off with the basics first. Um, chapter 21 is why we protect life. Um, and I just want to preface this video by saying something first, because a lot of people might be like, oh, well, you're Catholic, so that's why you believe that. Um, so I was raised Catholic, like my parents were Catholic. I was like I went along with it just because it was like what we did but I didn't really think deeper into these issues and like why we believe what we believe and what are the reasons but so I always thought that abortion was a religious belief I thought that oh well I would never impose my religion like I used to be pro-choice because I was like well I would never see myself get an abortion and like I think it's wrong but if someone else doesn't think it's wrong why should I impose my beliefs on them? So I thought it was wrong to, I thought it was wrong for someone of a religious belief to impose your religion on someone else. But as I've gotten older and I started to really think things through for myself, um, I started thinking about this issue more of why am I pro-choice? And I started to research it and it came down to what is human life? And the more I actually studied science like the science part of it that's what made me become pro-life and it's actually it's interesting because people are like oh well it's a religious belief i'm like for me it was actually it came down to the science of it that's what convinced me that a human life that's growing within a mother's body is actually not the mother's body because now everyone's like oh well it's the mother's body it's the woman's body anyone who studies science will know that it's not the mother's body. So I think most most of the things we're told to are lies and we grow up believing certain lies because it's just society kind of tells us these things and we just learn to accept it and it becomes normal for us and that's what we believe. But we really have to take a step back, think for ourselves, actually read science books. I remember going to the library all distraught in my like conversion of this topic experience, I was like, wait, it's like, I need to know like human life development, what happens, what is this? And I'm like, all the DNA is there, the genetics, what tells you that this is a separate entity than the mother's body is all there from the moment of conception. And I'm like, this is science. Our religion doesn't tell us that that's a human life. That's a scientific fact. And so part five, morality and destiny. Trent Horn starts off this chapter by talking about how in ancient Rome, the men had unlimited rights over their families, and it was a practice where some of them would take their infants, abandon them in the woods, leave them, they would be sold into slavery, they would die. And so during this horrific time, members of a new religion, Christianity, said that no one has this right. No one has the right to choose to directly kill another innocent human being. No one. And so back then, this is what was happening. Like, kids were being left out in the, wilder in the wilderness to die. Now, it's happening in clinics under the name of reproductive health. And so Trent Horn goes on to write imposing morality. And some people say, oh, if you don't like abortion, then just don't have one and how it's imposing morality on another person. But the point that Trent Horn makes is that civilized people actually do impose morality on other people all the time. Like for example, we as a society impose on people in stores, shoplifters, that stealing is wrong. And so the shoplifters might think, oh, well, it's not a big deal. It's like, well, you would never steal something, so why should you stop me from stealing? because, you know, you might think it's wrong, but if I don't think it's wrong, then I should be able to just do whatever I want. So we do, like, in society, impose morality on people. It's just a matter of justice. 
And then he also writes about child abuse, how we impose the view that child abuse is wrong on parents who might think, oh, well, it's not really a big deal. You know, it's my choice. It's my kids. I can do whatever I want. It's my home. And then Pope Benedict XVI has a quote, the state may not impose religion, yet it must guarantee religious freedom and harmony between the followers of different religions. And then Trent Horn goes on to write how he, one time he was giving a presentation at a university, and there was a woman in the audience who asked, would you deny abortion to a woman who has three kids and she just can't afford it? Um, their living conditions are gonna be terrible. They're not gonna have enough money to eat. And so the question is, would you deny abortion to a woman in that case? And then Trent Horn replied that yes, poverty is extremely difficult. But then he turned around the question to her and asked, so if she has too many kids already, he asked, would it be wrong for this woman to kill one of her children, one of her children who's already born, in order to free up resources for the new baby? Because, oh, well, you have too many kids, and so, you know, you can't afford all of them, so would that be okay? And she said, oh, no, of course that would be wrong. And then he said, why? And then she replied, because you can't kill real human beings. And so that just goes to show that the argument of poverty is really not the issue. The issue is, is this a human life? And is it right or wrong, regardless of the circumstances? And if it is, and I highly encourage everyone to study the science behind it, I feel like we're often told, oh, well, it's just a, a clump of cells, it's a blob of cells, or it's the woman's body. But have you ever taken a step back to think what exactly is that and at what point does it become wrong to kill like at what point does it become a human being with rights and dignity like what's that turning point and i've actually had conversations with friends before and they were like oh well it's when it has a heartbeat then it becomes a human and it's interesting because now there's this heartbeat law that was just passed in georgia and a lot of people are like oh how can they do that like women might not even know they're pregnant at six weeks and I'm like but people who are pro-choice have told me that it's wrong after it has a heartbeat so it's just it's super inconsistent and I really I feel like the Catholic Church is the only thing that's been consistent on the issue of human life and dignity and caring for the vulnerable it's like a lot of people pick and choose which life is worthy of respect and dignity. Something if you study history is that we've been dehumanizing the human person so many times to justify our immor immoral behavior. We kind of find ways to recognize a human as not a person to basically make it okay what we do. It's like, well, if it's not a person, then it's okay, you know. We so often rob people of their dignity. We use terms like animals, vermin, illegals, blob of cells, you know, like these words that kind of dehumanize the person and we categorize them into not a person. And so Trent Horn writes, what makes us human? If the fetus or unborn child is growing, then he or she must be alive. If a fetus has human parents and human DNA, then he or she must be human. The human fetus is also not a body part like skin cells or sperm or an egg. It is a whole human being who just needs time, nutrients, and the right environment in order to develop into a fully grown human being. The same things you and I need to develop into fully grown human beings. And he quotes the standard medical text, Human Embryology and Teratology, states, Fertilization, also called conception, is a critical landmark because under ordinary circumstances, a new genetically distinct human organism is formed. And then he goes on to write defining life. Um, so an embryo is a Greek word that means developing one, a human being from conception until the eighth week of life. And then a fetus, a Latin word that means young one, a human being from the eighth week of life until birth. So some people say that even if a fetus is a member of the human species, it is not a person, or it is not fully human. But then the question is, what is a person? What makes us fully human? Some people say like, oh, well, the ability to think or the ability to feel makes us a person. 
But then under those circumstances, newborns and also disabled people would fail that test. He writes how born babies can't think or feel more than non-human animals like cows or rats, but we treat those infants better than these animals just because they are biologically human. Since science proves that unborn children also belong to the human species, this means we should value unborn children in the same way we value newborns and protect them from being killed through abortion. Other people say that an unborn child isn't viable until birth, so it's not a person because it needs the mother's body in order to live. And then this makes me think how, when people say that, think about a newborn baby. It still needs its mother to, to survive. It can't survive on its own. Even though it is outside of the mother's body now, it still needs the support of the mother to go on. Or someone. It can't, it can't, it's not completely viable on its own. And Trenthorn goes on to write how unborn humans have the right to live in the environment that is designed to sustain their lives. And so while we do have the right to our own bodies, that doesn't give us the right to harm other innocent human beings. And then he has an interesting point that he writes also, if we expect fathers to be responsible and pay child support for the children they create, then shouldn't we expect mothers to be equally responsible for those same children? Shouldn't they provide child support through bodies that are naturally designed to care for those children? He goes on to answer the question of, what about in the case of rape? If a woman was raped, that is not her fault. She did nothing to deserve that. Like She should never be punished for what happened to her. But unfortunately, in our culture, sometimes we do blame women for the crimes committed against them. And in other cultures, women are actually executed for becoming pregnant through rape. Can you imagine how her, how horrible that is? No innocent person should ever suffer for the crimes of another person. And being that a child is another person, it's not a part of the woman's body, like it's not the woman's body, that child conceived is just as innocent as the mother was. And so why should we punish the child? Why don't we punish the person who's committing the crime? And we really need to have more um, support for this. We need to have more support for the victims. And then Trent Horn finishes this chapter talking about how the church opposes IVF because children have a right to be conceived and grow in the wombs of their mothers. They shouldn't be manufactured in a, in a laboratory by technicians who treat them like a product because human beings are not objects, they're persons. And then Trent Horn provides an example from law professor Richard S Richard Stith, in the 20th century, Polaroid cameras printed their pictures on paper that was stored inside the camera. And then as soon as the paper emerged from the camera, it just looked like a smudge. But then after a few minutes, the image began to appear on the paper. And so think about it, if you've ever used a pol Polaroid camera, you take the picture, you take the paper out and you look and you're like, okay, it's just, it's just a smudge, it's just, it's a dark, thing and you can't really tell what it is but then the same paper you're holding you watch it develop and you see before your eyes this image this beautiful image appears it just needs time to develop but it's still there all the information is there the moment you take the paper out destroying a human embryo or fetus doesn't end the life of a potential person it ends the life of a person with great potential these little persons who are in a stage of life we all went through possess the same dignity that exists in every human being from conception to natural death. This dignity deserves to be recognized and respected under the law, which is why the church fights for the right to life of all human beings, especially the weakest and the most vulnerable. And so that has been the view of the Catholic Church throughout all time and continues on. And it's really a beautiful thing and it's something that's worth fighting for and worth standing up for. And so we'll pick back up. The next video is going to be chapter 22, Why We Cherish Our Sexuality.